So in 2019, USDA as well as FDA decided they would jointly regulate the production of cell cultured meats. And USDA handles the meat production side of the process. So once the cells are harvested, once they leave the bioreactor in which that cell culture process has happened, USDA takes over regulatory authority. Prior to that, when it is the cell culture itself, when the cells are growing within the bioreactor, FDA regulates that part of the process. My USDA takes over the process. The regulatory authority and the guidance they have is the exact same for all other meat proteins that are produced in the U.S. So they regulate labels, they're regulating the sanitation. So what's actually happening as we take this cell culture, right, that we're going to transition into meat being consumed by humans and the process by which it makes it to a grocery store or a restaurant, that would be regulated by U.S. Cell culture meats, uh, they use uh, stem cells from actual animals, right? So they're going to go and get cells from a cow or a pig. It's, it's not without an animal. There are animal inputs. So they're going to obtain those cells from an actual animal. They'll put them in a, a sterile environment and give them the nutrients they need to grow. Uh, and as they start to grow, uh, there's There are physical structures inside of the bioreactor that serve kind of like um, the scaffolding around building a building or the frame of a building, right, that gives the cell culture as it's growing something to grow into or onto. Just like in an animal or in a human, we have bones. So in a bioreactor, the, the bones, if you will, are the scaffold, giving the cells something to grow around or grow into. I think the unknowns are the scary part. We, we don't know what's going to happen with cellular agriculture. We don't know what's going to happen with cell-based meat. Currently today, it's not commercially available. So you can't go to a grocery store. There are a couple of restaurants that are gonna place it on uh, you know, very elite menu items, but it's not available in mass quantities for the general public. You know, There's always that place of fear of what if, but what we've seen is that consumers tend to be steadfast in their demand for meat proteins produced in the traditional sense. You know, there's lots of conversations around the, the climate impacts of traditional agriculture, but we've seen through research and a lot of research done here at CSU that there are many positive attributes of that system. So the fact, for example, that cattle can graze on lands that can't be used for anything else, right? That crops won't grow or other food types won't grow. We also think about it from an economic and social perspective. That's the livelihood for a, a large portion of the country. And so what happens from a social sustainability perspective or an economic sustainability perspective if that changes? And what we do know is it's gonna take all of us. We all play a role in a, a healthy environment. We play a role in climate change. We play a role in food security. And it's going to take every single person. It's gonna take science and innovation, but it's also gonna take the person who's not a scientist, but is making good decisions at home. We're turning off the lights. It's uh, using less water when I don't have to water, like overwater my lawn. I, I think that's the root of the, the message with these really complicated problems. If you want to eat meat, that's amazing. Here's some ways that you can make, you can make choices that work for you. If you choose not to eat meat, that's amazing as well. Here are some choices that work for you. I think one of the things that is easy in this space, which is really interesting, is we try to pin each other against the other. And the reality is at the end of the day, we want to be healthy. We want to make sure that the food, whatever it is, is safe and it's accessible and it delivers the nutrients we need. And there's no need for that to be contentious.